اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد الله صل على الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائه مجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله وجورنا وجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام <clears throat> we stated as the tenets that Islam has created this relationship between the human being and God, whereby giving purpose, meaningfulness, wholesomeness to human existence. It has also explained the human being, where the human being belongs in the wider context. It has spoken about the world, the greater world around it, and the place of the human being within the greater world. It has stated to the human being that you are not created in vain. You are here for a lofty purpose. That lofty purpose is designated as God, the peak of all aspiration. It is with this that immediately the human heart finds some form of direction. It is placed within a context. Life is not merely lived for the sake of living it. There is a reason for this life. And then the human being begins on this journey of the attainment of the objective, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At every point, therefore, there is a motion from within the human being in which the human being realistically sees fulfillment. There is completion of some form from within. We stated that we are in an evolutionary trend. Immediately when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placed at the helm of human existence, it becomes God-centric and human being becomes the subject. The human being is called towards completion of his own self. This is what we called self-realization and in the realist of sense the only thing that we find is worthy and worthwhile is when we in every subsequent day of our lives feel more fulfilled more acquired more self-realized so immediately religion makes this otherwise a mundane meaningless life into a very meaningful life a purposeful life in addition to that, it has been mindful of the immediate context of the human being. As a human being, you are on the face of this earth. You are interacting with each other. Here again, it has stipulated broad understandings of here and hereafter. Between these two, it has regulated the cross-section of human relations in terms of a balance of the world and the hereafter. We stated this yesterday, that it has then in that way made the life of this world very meaningful in terms of the objective, that make this world into a farm for the hereafter, where everything that is done in this world yields towards the hereafter. But more than that, what is so appealing about Islam is that it talks about this beautiful balance in every aspect of life. I'm just recapping for a few minutes so that we can then bring back the context and discuss today's discussion, continue with today's discussion. 
it has very realistically taken into account the human being as the human being is without omitting any facet of human existence. It has spoken very broadly and generally about what human life is and touched upon every aspect and sought to bring in this balance. Why was this balance so necessary? We stated yesterday that when it establishes this vertical relation between the individual and the objective which is Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, spirituality and morality become the central tenets of human existence. And that is what gives this sense of meaningfulness to human being and human existence that I am becoming something and we feel that increase in existence, that increase in spirituality. But at the same time, unlike other Abrahamic faiths which through the ages have forgotten, Islam has been very, very mindful that the life of this world and interactions in this life have to go and constitute towards the formation of this moral being and these interactions of this world, no matter how mundane they may be, have to become meaningful and add in a meaningful way towards the creation of a moral and a spiritual being. In that we stated that it has to be totally in sync with human nature. Human nature we defined as what? As primarily an evolutionary nature in sync and in line with the property of existence which is always evolving. Here therefore, Islam is totally mindful of the multifaceted nature of the human being. It addresses human being in the capacity of the human being being an individual. And it addresses the human being in the capacity of a community. It talks about absolutes and it talks about relatives. It gives broad principles and it allows for human interpretation. It instructs by itself and it allows human being to benefit as a community and as an individual from their experiences and the experiences of those around them. We gave examples of all of this yesterday. The centrality here is of these two relations, God, human, here, hereafter, that creates that beautiful balance. Now you will see that it is only through balance that we can find swift growth from within. Unlike other systems who reject the hereafter and subsequently devoid the human existence of any true and real meaning, Islam places hereafter as a central tenant of human existence. As opposed to those sort of Sufi systems that neglect the worldly life and hence render the life as meaningless, Islam places equal emphasis on the life of this world. By having a very realistic understanding, it creates this beautiful balance and it is through this balance that the human being progresses in its multifaceted capacity as an individual, as a community, and evolves as a brilliant human being. Now the other thing that Islam was very, very mindful of was another central tenant of the human existence in accordance with human nature. Existence flows, and I don't want to give difficult terms, from potentiality to actuality, from a state of weakness to a state of strength. We always witness this, even though it can always be said that the strength is already embedded within the potential, yet it needs to be allowed to flourish, evolve and arrive at its own completion. We find a small seed when placed within the ground, it is nothing but potential. When the physical conditions are ripe, then the seed is allowed to sprout. It needs assistance from outside to allow itself to reveal itself from its own inside and arrive at its own completion. Islam sees this as a facet of existence 
and sees this as a central tenant of the nature of human existence, whether as a human individual or human community. And therefore, Islam addresses itself to human life in a very natural way, not presuming a state of strength, but understanding a state of weakness and addressing the state of weakness and from weakness bringing about strength and glorious existence. Now imagine this brilliance of Islam in being able to understand this. Contrary to the mindset of the Muslim community at present, where we feel that our children should take birth as angels, Islam considers children as animals. From the cradle of animality, it wishes to bring about an angelic divine being. Similarly, it understands the community. The community it understands as a very primitive community at its inception. And from that will come about an intellectual, moral, spiritual human community. Now, when that is a realistic understanding of human existence in line and in sync with the properties of existence, just as the Big Bang arrives from those unworthy particles and flows into this that we see, just as a seed arrives to a glorious state of a tree and becomes a fruit-bearing tree, just as an ovule, just as an ovum, a fertilized cell develops into a fetus and then into a child and then into a toddler and then into a young being and then into a grown adult and then into a spiritual being, Islam regards the cross-section of human condition to be the same the human individual and the human community. So what are we trying to say? What we are trying to say here is that the same laws, the same ethics, the same morality that befit a sophisticated intellectual, spiritual community are not the same as those that would address themselves to a very primitive community. Just as the requirements are of a grown adult, of being intellectual, of being spiritual. Those would not be the requirements required from a child. They will be different. Islam understands this and has had a very realistic understanding of how the human nature is and how it works from weakness to strength. And as we go into this theme, the Prophet of Islam, when he came, he presumed no state of strength. He understood their potential. And he saw little openings in those potential of goodness. And he sought to increase it. With the result that after 23 years, he leaves behind a highly moral community that was awaiting a birth in the cradle of animality or in the cradle of bestiality. That is the sort of community he found. That community could never have tolerated the end result had it been given to them at the very outset. Do you not see? Initially when he came, he said, Kulu la ilaha illallah tuflahu. Just say la ilaha illallah and you will attain salvation. People said la ilaha illallah and they were attaining salvation. There were no requirements of them. They weren't asked to do anything. No prayer, no fasting, no social commitments, no jihad, no defense, no rights of each other. A mere statement was enough for them. He saw a slight opening and then he worked on that slight opening and brought the flowering of humanity in that community. Now the great appeal of Islam has been this, that in this way it has not left any facet of human existence untouched. Where do you find a religion that has touched upon the cross-section of human life? It has instructions on how to raise children, but in a natural way. It says in children, feel first, they understand later on, and then they become responsible. 
we might find these very ordinary statements of the Prophet, but believe me, these are essences of existence. That before you speak to the child, when the child is within the womb, it has already begun to form those nerve endings that are giving it a sense of perception of outside in terms of feel. So a mother ought to be in wudu, let us say, or listen to the Quran, not to be in a quarrelsome environment, not to sleep at night in an agitated state, because that is making the child what the child is becoming. When the child takes birth, forgive me for giving these examples if they seem very mundane, because we want to go back to our theme, which is rather um, controversial, as can be expected, but we'll go through this. And then when the child takes birth, display good morals to the child, but because before they begin to analyze what they see through their eyes and hear through their ears, they are feeling everything. And whatever they will analyze subsequent to that will be analyzed in accordance with that feel factor. How true is that? And how much in sync with nature is that? Imagine if today I am feeling in a particular way, no matter what you say to me, will be inevitably interpreted in the way that I feel, not in the way you are trying to say it. Bring that obvious story of that philosopher in the time of the 11th or 10th Imam who was writing a book about the inconsistency found within the Quran. And when it approached the Imam, the Imam said to his servant, ask this great man, are these inconsistencies within his understanding of the Quran or are they the consistencies within the Quran and the mind of the author of the Quran? Immediately as this question was posed to him, he threw the whole of his work into the fire. As a philosopher, he understood that there are inconsistencies in his interpretation. No matter how we are from within, that is how we will understand the information outside ourselves. And these simple instructions of the Prophet, they are so meaningful that your children are your lords. Let them be for the first seven years, so on and so forth. We might just pass by these instructions, but they are totally in sync with the way human beings are to bring the human individual from the point of weakness to a point of great strength. Similarly, Islam touches upon marital rights, beginning from a state of weakness to a state of strength. The rights of neighbors, the rights of parents, how to govern a state, the rights of leaders, the rights of subjects, so on and so forth. Interaction between people of different faiths, this is what gave Islam this huge appeal that it is so embracing. But all of these laws that Islam has given, moral instructions that it gives, the anecdotes we find within the spiritual literature and within the Quran have to be understood in light of Islam addressing itself to the subjects in accordance with their nature. Now, let us take the obvious examples from the life of the Prophet before we can go into our own theme and come to the core of what we are trying to say. When the Prophet came, the Prophet found a drunkard community in front of him. He did not, and you find this in the Quran, you have three or four different verses from Surah Baqarah into Surah Ali Imran and later on, in which consumption of alcohol is being addressed step by step by step. What does that show to us? That the human beings are beings that flow from weakness to strength if they are directed gently and properly. And then their context has to be kept in mind. Whatever produces growth at that context becomes their truth but it may not be their truth subsequent to that. So for example, in the case of the consumption of alcohol, we find gentle verses, gently admonishing them. And finally, we find a decisive verse saying that will you not desist? And Allah is quite emphatic at that point. By that time, this community had matured. And they said, yes, of course. It is something which is very, very detrimental. But the point of the matter is, it went from weakness into strength. 
Similarly, when there was a drought in Medina, and when a, a, a crop became scarce, the businessmen who had hoarded this crop started charging extortionate prices. They went to the Prophet, we find this example in the fiqh. They went to the Prophet and they said to the Prophet, why don't you fix the price of crop? It was sub, sub, something that the head of state could do very easily and Islam would allow for it. But look at the foresight of the Prophet in line with attaining that objective, God, centricity, and human being being the subject and creating this beautiful balance. He stated, I dislike fixing prices and coercion. They said, why? The possible reply here is that if the promise of hereafter, arriving at God, at an eternal state of glory and pleasure, is not enough to move them from the state of animal greed that no form of fixing of prices will move them. Can you see that? What was he trying to say? That they are in a state of weakness in their own context. They need to be addressed in a way that is meaningful for them to gently move them to a state of strength. Now tell me, if there was coercion in Islam, by fixing of prices, then what would have happened would have been that that central tenant of godliness, world, human, God connection, would have immediately lost its force. The law of the earth would become forceful and then human beings would become obedient for the sake of the black and white of the law and not because of any lofty objective. And the prophet could never ever compromise that for that is the absolute truth. In light of this, we immediately see the absurdity of laws such as the law of apostasy. And immediately we begin to realize that there has to be a more real context in which the law of apostasy would make sense. In a context of the nature of human being and the whole law of evolution. We see here that the prophet was trying to do something in accordance with their own context in relation to their own state of weakness. Now we say something here that he had to be mindful of their own context. Can we read Salwat and come far forward as far forward as possible? <laughs> Although we are going to discuss this afterwards, maybe tomorrow, that Allah involves Himself in every mundane aspect of human life, one of the verses you find in the Quran is Allah saying, when you are told to make space, make space, Allah will make space for you. He involves Himself so intimately in human life. So once again, read Salawat and come forward. The Prophet had to be mindful of his immediate context. Looking at their context, he addressed them, gave them Islam. That Islam was sacred in their context, but their context was one of weakness. The truth was one of self-realization and evolution. The absolute tenant is reaching out to God. The means towards it was a balanced life between here and hereafter. What became secondary was the immediate expression of Islam. What is fundamental is the tenant of God, human relation, here, hereafter. Are we understanding that? Whatever falls in the middle becomes secondary. Whatever falls in the middle needs to be understood in two ways. Their context of weakness, their nature of weakness. One is the individual nature of weakness. One is the collective level of weakness, wanting to promote strength. One is the overall world in a state of weakness, arriving at greater glory. Now, I'm going to point out two things as we go forward. The human community at the life in the time of the Prophet arrived from weakness into a, a state of glorious strength. We can't deny that. So we will say, does that mean now that they've arrived, 
The answer is yes, but only in their limited context. The rest of the world is now going to interact. They are going to move forward. Inevitably, their own context will change. And as their context evolves, they have to evolve. And as they have to evolve, the whole of the expression of Islam will have to change. Now I'll explain that again. Today, we find a Muslim community. People are drunkards. People are this, people are that. They are not to be condemned. They are to be seen in a state of weakness. Islam needs to apply to them in their personal context to bring them out of weakness into a state of strength. The Muslim community is decaying. Should the same expectations be there of that community? No. They need to be addressed at their own level of weakness. Islam needs to formulate itself at their level of weakness and bring them to the state of strength. That is the first level. What about the second level? The whole of the world has evolved. And as a result, Islam has faced challenges. Look at the challenge we are getting from relativity, from plurality, from technological advancements, from medical advancements. What is the meaning of life and death? What is the meaning of euthanasia? What is the meaning of social conventions? What is the worth of conventional laws? All of these things now are challenges that were not there before through the evolution of the whole world which breaks our limited context. On the other hand, the individual has to evolve. On the other hand, the whole community as community identity has to evolve. And bear in mind the lectures of yesterday where we talked about embracing universal cultures and particular cultures. Now I will say something here that might seem odd. But the Shias condemn the Sunnis for washing their feet in wudu. And of course, when a person reads that verse of wudu, there is no washing of feet. But then, the Sunnis condemn the Shias for washing their arms downwards as opposed to upwards. The verse without analysis, critical analysis, if looked at at face value, would suggest watching this way. Why has the Quran left it so ambiguous? Why has the Quran left it so ambiguous? You know, last time we suggested that the fast should be 16 hours and no more. Somebody went and said, if that was the case, then Allah should have known that. And Allah should have made contingency for that within the Quran. Tell me, is 16 hour fast and 20 hour fast more detrimental or the whole issue of the prophetic narration, which I don't believe is valid altogether, and even if it is valid, it does not mean what the Muslims have understood. Or is the prophetic narration that Islam will be split into 73 sects and 72 of them will go to hell? Is that more pressing issue or the issue of fast? Why couldn't have God clarified that Imam Ali Salamullah is the first Imam in the Quran to avoid 72 sects going into hell? We can see here that there is more to it than our naive minds are understanding. The Quran leaves that verse ambiguous to allow for variety of interpretations. And maybe it is saying that all these interpretations are valid. You might not have a scenario in which you have right and wrong. You may have right and lesser rights. Not an absolute situation of right and absolute wrong or right and lesser right the quran says in some verses this is the best way what do you mean the best way why not the only way can you not see that because quran is mindful of this nature of human beings that we are all varied people context changes there is weakness into strength that produces of necessity relativity everywhere but there is no sacredness to any of these expressions. Sacredness is contained within those central tenets. Human reaching out to God, God's centricity. Here, hereafter, these are the broad parameters. Everything within it is an expression for the attainment of that spirituality, morality, self-actualization, self-realization, a state of glory from a state of weakness. Everything else is in the middle. Imam Ali in one of his hadiths has stated 
that Allah has made halal, He has made haram, and He has remained silent in so many things. Do not compel Him to speak in those things. Why? Because you as human individuals and communities will exercise your minds in those parameters. And you will formulate your own selves. And it will be as right as anything, so long as it suits the purpose of growth and self-realization. Did we not say yesterday that it's nonsensical to say these cultures are wrong and religion is right? I will say the religion, and we'll talk about this, came in a cultural context. Culture is wrong if it defies that central tenant, and religious expression is wrong if it defies that central tenant. Just as cultures are ours, the Islam that I understand is my interpretation. The fiqh that I understand is my interpretation of the sacred law. The morality that I understand is my interpretation. There are central tenets, everything else in the middle is giving only there to arrive at those centralities and central points. Now look at the Quran. When it comes to capital punishment, look at how minimalistic the Quran is. Look at how minimalistic the Quran is. When it comes to fornicators, it does not talk about stoning to death. Where does it say stoning to death? When it comes to lesbianism and gayism, look at what the capital punishments are within the Quran. Look at the way in which we have understood it. Yes, if those capital punishments were given an expression, then they were given an expression in that context in order to promote growth. There was no centrality to that. The centrality was to growth and nothing else. To those central tenets. Revert to the Quran. Now people are pointing fingers. I just want to state one or two things before we go into this thing properly. People say that the Prophet married a nine-year-old and the charge of pedophilia. Now we can argue it from a variety of ways, yes? This negative connotation that we have today did not exist at that point. And to be honest with you, maybe it requires a little bit of a prelude. I was talking with a, a friend of mine, sorry, a father of a friend of mine, a father of a student of mine. And he stated to me that his grandfather was shipped to Africa during the British Raj to work on the railway system at the age of nine. From India to Africa at the age of nine, he was mature enough to handle the responsibility of working on the railway lines, maybe just carrying things and food to the people working there or removing uh, rubble or whatever. But their parents, his parents conceded and consented for him to go. That level of maturity was there in that young child, at least to that level. But Islam at that point in time understood the human being in terms, of their, in terms of their biological function. That if she menstruates and she is capable of having children, then she is performing her biological function. Get her married off. But at the time of Imam Sadiq, what did he say? He said, no, a girl becomes mature at the age of 13 or when she menstruates. As society changed, the physical human nature also changed. And today we know in different parts of the world, Girls menstruate at different ages in accordance with the food that they eat, the lifestyle that they abide by, the weather that is there, and the expectations that are up upon them. But Islam formulated itself in accordance with its immediate context. That was the immediate context. And it saw human being within the cradle of animality. And from there, it wished to bring about a glorious human being. It does not mean that today nine-year-old children should get married. They are not mature enough to understand what marriage is. Today I would say not even an 18-year-old lady should get married if they are not mature enough to understand what responsibility is. But the context has changed. There was no sacredness and centrality to that law. Centrality was to those central tenants. The tenant of reaching out to God. I'm sorry I'm repeating it again and again because I want to rid ambiguities from our talk. And here and hereafter. Whatever is in the middle gives itself to these central tenants of growth and becoming godliness. <laughs> Similarly, you get the charge of slavery. Although I believe that the Quran is an eternal word. And for me, slavery has a very different meaning. But let's talk about slavery at face value. 
In those days, it was a convention. They did not know what to do apart from that. So Islam operated within that convention and within that immediate context and initiated a movement to free slaves. In today's day and age, slavery is preposterous to even think about. The human community has become so sophisticated that we have universal human rights as an absolute norm that we must talk about. But look at the beauty of Islam in the way that it allows for human growth within broad parameters. Think about it. If you look at the Quran, it does not condemn nor condone monarchy, nor feudalism, nor shura, nor wilayatul faqih or any other system. Why has it left it so open? Because it knows that it's exactly in accordance with human nature from weakness to strength. That certain communities do need a benevolent tyrant upon them. Certain communities do need a monarchy. Certain communities who are dying for and struggling for survival would do better in a feudalistic system. Certain communities are better off in a communist socialist system. Certain communities need to arrive at a sense of democracy. It has left it open to allow for two tenets. One of human growth and the other one of relativity. That the growth does not have uniformity across the world. It's so in sync with human nature. Now here, you might ask, and this is a question that has been posed by the modernists. That why did the Prophet designate Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, as the Khalifa, knowing full well that autonomy of the individuals was the thing that ought to have prevailed. Allah is saying, like Raha din there is no compulsion religion as an existentialist principle. There can be no compulsion, otherwise there is no growth. Through compulsion there is no growth. Growth can only be through a balanced state and free flow of existence. Why did the Prophet do that? Very easily in terms of this theory, it's very easy to answer that the Prophet immediately took their consent and says, am I not possessing of a greater right over you than you yourselves? They said, Bala ya Rasulullah. He said, and in that case, I appoint this man to be your head in your evolutionary trend. He is the right person for you to give you that growth. He took their undertaking and gave them Ali ibn Abi Talib. So it was perfectly legitimate and set, set them off on the lines, on the trend of evolution. Similarly, when the Prophet came, he said, look, I'm a divine guide, but so long as you don't accept me, I cannot exercise my capacity over you. Immediately, when they gave him the right, he became effective in guiding them. Hussein ibn Ali says to Hur, you invited me. At your behest, I came here. If you retract your invitation, let me be, I will go back. I have no obligation beyond that. Respecting that human autonomy. And self-determinism. So here we find Quran is totally in sync with human nature. Now it is here that I want to point at certain things that we will be dealing with later on. I find that Islam is utmost beautiful and accurate in the way it's understood. The human individual and the progression and growth of human being. If we look at the context in which Islam came, it addressed its community in its own context. The centrality was for those four things that we are talking about. It gave a balanced life, gave an expression of Islam that would allow them their growth and reach their objective. In that, it spoke of conventional laws. For example, the law of inheritance. That the woman gets half the share of man's inheritance. Why? Because the woman is seen as a carer in accordance with her nature. She is a carer. She is a life-giving force and the force that nurtures life. She has that as a facet of her personality. So Islam addresses her in that way. And the man is the provider. Without obliging her, he needs to provide for her as a daughter, as a wife, as a mother. And it works. And I would say that in this society as well, if we were to apply the same rule, we would find the production of a brilliant community. However, 
by our own admission, we are saying that there is no uniformity in the world. Yes, there are universals, but there is relativity in growth. And if there is relativity in growth, and if every region has its own context, and if Islam initially applied to those people in their context, then today Islam should not enforce an alien context upon this context, but should be by right able to address this context in its own context and achieve its own evolution and growth. Is that making sense? Let us just explain that again. Islam came in the Arabian context. It applied itself in that context in accordance with that context. With the centrality of God, human, here, hereafter. So the way in which it formulated itself was to bring about balance between here, hereafter that would lead towards a state of godliness. In that context. With this admission that no two contexts are the same. Because people evolve very differently. So today, if Islam were to apply, it would apply to different regions in their own context. What would not change would be those central tenets of human-God relation, balance between the here and hereafter. Everything else in the middle can acquire a different expression. So now today in this context, if you were to say that the woman inherits half of what man inherits, it would not make sense. It would have to address itself differently, but still direct itself towards the central goal. And then modify the situation that the human community arrives at this level, where it is seen that a woman is a carer, man is a provider, and that is the only way to produce a brilliant human community. Let us give another example. The Quran talks about zakat. The Quran talks about khums. None of these are outside context. If they were outside the context, people would ask, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? Let us talk about khums because it is less controversial than uh, zakat. And we want to talk, deal with these subjects thoroughly afterwards. Khums is not in isolation of a context. Before the Prophet came, the Arab chiefs, used to take one-fourth of every form of income from their clans to the extent that we have numerous poems condemning the heads by saying to them, you take this right, you take that right, and on top of that, whatever we have gained, you take a fourth of it. Islam addressed homes in that context, that the Prophet will take a fifth and it will not be strictly for the Prophet, but for these, but for these subjects. And we'll explain that afterwards. But this was the context of Khums. Now, when it came to Imam Ali, alayhi, he immediately said, I have forgiven you my share. Imam Bakir said, we have forgiven you our share. But there came a year in which Imam Bakir imposed Khums on gold. And then he gave a reasoning. He said, for this year... I have imposed khums on these added subjects. Why? In order to see to the needs of the growing community. There was no centrality to the fifth or the sixth or the fourth. The centrality was for that particular tenant of bringing about a balance between here, hereafter and driving the community towards God. And that is why the imams were changing those laws and expressions. There was centrality for something else. Everything else was in sync with evolution. If we can understand the central message of Islam in this way, then we will begin to understand that Islam as Islam is something else. What we are abiding by in the name of Islam is an interpretation and an expression of Islam. If that is the case, then the law system of Islam is designed altogether in line with the goal and the objective and in sync with human nature. And it is nothing but an expression of the sacred law, where the sacred law is what? One that allows for swift growth in whatever context the human community is.
It will reform our minds and our attitudes all together. We just gave one or two examples of child marriage, of homes, of slavery, but it applies across the board. Here now, in this part of the world, and these are my closing statements because the time has finished, we are faced with numerous challenges in the modern world. The first is that that paradigm of Muslim land and land adverse to Islam and land at peace with Islam no longer exists. So all the laws within the legal system that were formulated to govern the situation of that paradigm have become redundant. What has not become redundant is the centrality of those laws and the essence, which was what? To bring about evolution in that context. Can you see that? Today, in international communities, we are talking about plurality. Today, we have a clear-cut notion that Quran supplies. Friend of God and enemy of God. And that's about it. There is no notion of religious divide of the world. It is divided on the lines of nation states. It is not divided on the lines of religions. This is Christian, this is Muslim, this is Jew, this is non-Muslim, this is Kafir, this is Mushrik. No longer. It is a different paradigm. So those laws, whether they were laws of interaction of states or living within foreign states or the judicial systems or moral laws of how to look at the other as a protected entity within our land or as a person without any legal status as in the case of the uh, of the mushrik or the kafir in the time of the land of the islam in the land in, 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 in the former paradigm the mushriks were people without any social identity they did not have any legal identity either they did not have a say they were not recognized but the uh, jews and the christians had identity personalities and they had their laws but today the paradigm has changed altogether the morality of how to interact with the other has totally changed. Whereas those texts of the Prophet that says, respect your neighbors, ask of your neighbors, was found in the context of Muslim neighborhood. Today, they will stretch themselves to a pluralistic neighborhood. Pluralism is the norm. That paradigm no longer exists. Be good to your neighbor no matter what they are. So long as they don't fall within the folds of the enemy of God, which is an absolute distinction that Quran makes and human beings make. We're not only talking about these sort of laws of marriages, slavery, inheritance. We are talking about the change of the total understanding, outlook, paradigm, morality and legality with it. Because legal Islam is a mechanism constructed to arrive at those lofty morals and to drive us towards that state of spirituality. Today, when we ask these questions about euthanasia, organ donation participating in a non-muslim judicial system they will not be responded to adequately from those texts of the imams that were issued during the time of bani abbas dynasty for there the paradigm was of a just legitimate ruler and an unjust usurper the paradigm has changed altogether but the centrality of what they were saying the central content will still be alive and it needs to be reformulated we stated this yesterday, and we need to finish this lecture here. That Hussein ibn Ali Salamullah Alay and the Imams, they were people who have always stated this. Towards the later part of these lectures, we will point out how the Imams have always been indicating at this. They have always been stating this, but we have failed to read it. And we have failed to understand it due to our bias. Hussein ibn Ali understood a very different level of Islam to the one that these people understood, the ones that killed him. We gave the example of Kholi. Kholi justified the killing of Hussein based on a verse that he who rises in arms against a legitimately elected or appointed leader should be put to death. He argued on those lines. Hussein did not understand that, that, that particular hadith to mean anything. Similarly, the people in the time of Hussein ibn Ali understood the kafir, the mushrik, the Christian, the Jew in a particular way, Imam Hussein saw them in a very different way altogether. And this is quite apparent from the way in which he was and the things that he did. En route 
to Kufa. Two things are happening simultaneously. Hussein Salamullah is moving to Kufa and meeting people coming out of Kufa. And at that point, time coincides with Muslim Ibn Akil's battle with the forces of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Muslim is taken to the roof of the court of Ibn Ziyad, Darul Imara. He states to Ibn Ziyad that allow me to make my final will. He states, make your final will. He makes his will. The final term of his will is, tell Aba Abdullah that the people of Kufa have deserted him not to advance to Kufa. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad says, as for the rest, I will have it fulfilled. But this message will not be sent to Hussein ibn Ali. He is brought on top of Darul Imara and he is asked to kneel. As Muslim kneels, the faithful sword descends upon him. His head falls to the ground and his body remains on top of the roof. Before his head descends, he looks in the direction of Medina and states, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Aba Abdullah. We are told that Hussein is moving towards Kufa. He pauses, becomes attentive, and says, Wa alaikum, salam, Ya Muslim. He feels a sense of unease within his heart. And then he receives the news that Muslim has been martyred. He camps at that point, asks for the daughters of Muslims to be sent to him. When the daughters of Muslims come to Hussein, he caresses their heads. They look at Hussein and they say, Oh, uncle, has something happened to our father? He says, Oh, child, fear not. If your father is no longer, I am your father. My daughters are your sisters. There is a cry that the daughters of Muslims have been orphaned. As the women wail, Sakina thinks to herself, what does it mean to be orphaned? Why does my father show such love and tenderness to the daughters of Muslim? We see this scene being repeated at the final battle of Hussein, When he descends from his steed and takes Sakina into his lap, she says, Oh, Father, caress my head as you caress the head of an orphan. Hussein moves forward. His path to Kufa is intercepted. He is redirected. He comes to a place where he wishes to camp. He asks Zuhair, Oh, Zuhair, what is this place? Zuhair states, this place is called Aqar. Aqar means wound. Hussein speaks, Allah, we seek refuge from wounds. Move on, O Zuhair. <coughs> Zuhair moves on. Imam engages with Hur. O Hur, allow us to rest here. Hur refuses. He says, Hur, allow us to return to Medina. Hur refuses. Hur, allow us to go on a different path. Hur refuses. Hussein is forced to take a path at the banks of the Euphrates in the Nagnawa. He arrives at a point where his steed refuses to move. He spurs Zuljana, but Zuljana refuses. It is said, according to the Riwayah, he changes six horses. When all of them refuse to move, he turns to Zuhair and he says, Zuhair, what is this land? He states, it's known as Taf, the banks of Euphrates. He says, does it have another name? It is known as Neinawa. Does it have another name? He said, it is known as Karb and Bala. When he hears the name of Karb and Bala, which means tribulations and sorrows, he descends from his steed. He takes his spear and embeds it firmly within the sands and calls out, Wallahi, by Allah, Ha huna mana khuriqabina. This is the place where our animals shall rest, where our tents shall be pitched, where we shall be killed, where our women shall be taken as captives, where our children shall be orphaned. 
It is here we shall be buried, and from here we shall be raised. As he was saying this, and as he gave instructions for his camp to be pitched there, Umm Kulthum hastened to him, and she said, Oh, brother, what is this place? I feel a sense of distress and fear within my heart. He said, Oh, sister, this is that very place where our father rested, coming back from Siphine in the lap of our brother, and when he fell asleep momentarily, he awoke suddenly and he cried out. And he said, Wa Aba Abdullah. I hastened to him and I said, Oh Father, what has befallen you? He said, I slept and I saw in a dream that this land was flooded with blood. All the people that you had with you were killed and you were being slaughtered mercilessly. He looked at me and he said, Oh Aba Abdullah. What shall you do when such a time befalls you? I said, O oh, Father, I shall persevere for the sake of Allah. He said, and in that case, receive the glad tidings that you shall be with me in paradise. We read that Hussein ibn Ali called the inhabitants of this land and purchased the land from them and then gifted it back to them and took the undertakings from them. Three Promises, he said, O oh people, on the Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, I shall be killed. My body shall lay upon the plains of Karbala in a most undignified state, without a head and without any clothing. Come and bury me after the enemies of God have left. Then he called the women of the clan of Bani Asad and he said to them that if your man through fear of these people cannot bury us, then when you come to fetch water at al -Qama, place dust upon our naked bodies. And then we hear from popular narrations that he summoned the little children and he said to the little children, oh children, if your parents are unable to cover our bodies, when you come to play in this spot, then throw dust upon our bodies as you play. Allah la'anatul ala al-qawmi al-zalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina zalamu wa yamun qalabin yanqaribun. Matam ya Hussain.